right. Hello, everyone. This is a full house tonight. Levels sound good? Yeah. All right. All right. So I guess we have a lot of people here. A lot of, lot of, a uh, lot of news this week and last week, and I guess the week before. And um, we're in a very different world than we were at the last meetup. So it's a. Uh, and uh, we have a, a lot of exciting speakers tonight. We have uh, Philip Rosedale and the High Fidelity team returning, which I'm super excited about, and they are uh, perfectly timed for the news about the Facebook uh, acquisition of Oculus. Uh, we have uh, Brian Bruning from Cast AR, or from Technical Illusions, the creators of Cast AR. So that's pretty exciting. We've been trying to get him here for a while, and really excited he's here. And we have Sebastian Kuntz, all the way from France who is, uh, I, I told him I had a short list of uh, dream speakers for SVBR when we first put this idea together. And he was on it, but he was so far away that we didn't ask him. But he was here for GDC, and we managed to keep him here an extra week. And um, that's really exciting as well. Also, Philip, you were on that list. And you're here twice. So that's awesome. <laughs> I'm here. All right, but uh, before we begin, um, Cymetic Bruce is uh, unfortunately not here again tonight because of his work schedule. Um, as we know, last year it got pretty hectic in the summer, so hopefully some VR company is looking for someone and will hire him so that he can focus full-time on uh, evangelizing VR, which is, we know what he loves. Um, so I have a short announcement about SVVR uh, before we start. So, does anyone know the significance of this date, May 16th, 2013? Anyone, anyone? This was the date of the very first SVBR. Uh, it's coming up soon. It's a year away, which is kind of amazing. And, and in this year, so much has happened, and our little hobby is kind of building into a real industry, one that's enough to pique Facebook's interest, which I would not have expected that in this year. A lot of things that happened in this year. Um, so it's our birthday, and we had this idea about how to celebrate our birthday. We've been kind of playing with it for a long time. And um, circumstances have, uh, have, have fall everything's fallen into place, and we're going to make this happen. So for our birthday, uh, we are going to have the first SVBR conference and expo. <laughs> so we don't have all the details yet because this is, uh, <laughs> we're, we're frantically putting it together. Uh, we actually had a date of September and we actually had to move it closer. So we're on an accelerated schedule, but it's all coming together. Um, we are going to have it uh, May 19th and 20th at the Computer History Museum, which has significance because it's where we held our first meetup. And it is also the home of the Sword of Damocles, the very first HMD, stereoscopic HMD. So it, it, has, it has a lot of uh, meaning to us, the space. Um, so we don't have all the details yet, but we do know that we are going to have some friends there for our birthday party. Oculus will be there, Success will be there, Road to VR will be there. We're going to add a ton of companies and awesome keynotes, and we're going to address, we're, we're going to head on address all the issues that are, uh, that are troubling us and concerning us and all the questions that we have, uh, especially regarding the Facebook acquisition of Oculus. Oculus will be there, um, and they will be uh, engaging with the community and, and truly listening, I think. They, they definitely seem very interested in listening and you know, finding out our thoughts and trying to work with us on this. Um, so we don't have the exact pricing yet, but it's a two-day conference. We are shooting for three to 400 people. Um, it is going to be, whoops. Sorry about that, plus that mic. It is going to be uh, roughly 450 for a regular ticket, 350 for indie developers, and we are going to extend a, a, an additional $100 to the SVVR core group, um, and we'll give you a code for that. So it'll be 250 for you guys. If that is still too much for you, there's another way. Uh, we are going to need help. We're going to need volunteers. Um, to help with registration, um, security, if anyone likes beating people up, whatever you're into. Uh, we're going to have a lot of jobs. So if you're interested in being a volunteer, put in six hours and you can attend for free. 
Um, so if you're interested, speak to Nana at the door. Um, she's got a clipboard there and she's gonna take your email and put that on the list and we will get in touch with you very soon. Uh, we're gonna formally announce the details of this conference over the next few days. So look for more information on that. And with that, um, we are going to hand it over to our first speaker. So, Brian, that's you. Greetings. Volume okay? Yeah. Excellent. I hope you guys don't mind. I did not prepare any slides. <laughs> um, but I've also uh, talked a lot about this recently at the Game Developer Conference, so I think we'll be able to cover some of the more uh, highlighted points. And keep it down to about 10 minutes. I'd like to leave about five minutes towards the end of this for questions and answers, and uh, to specifically address any of the things that you guys want to hear about rather than what I want to tell you about. Um, I'm Brian Brady. I am the Vice President of Marketing and Business Development, and I also work with all the different uh, content developers throughout Cast AR. And um, we're going to talk a little bit tonight about the company and the product. And well, actually, why don't we start with? Tell, tell me, uh, raise, everybody, raise your hands. Who's heard of Cast AR? Okay, that's good. Thank you. I'm, as a marketing guy, I'm, I'm happy to see that many hands. Um, who's tried Cast AR? Wow. Okay, that's pretty good. We've been trying to go to a lot of events. It's, as with many things in VR and AR, it's something you really need to experience um, on yourself to truly understand. Um, it's a unique product in, in this category, and um, we're proud to have it here tonight with us, um, and we're, we're continuing to make product iterations that we'll talk about. But Cast AR, for those who, who don't know much about it or want to hear how we're describing it recently, it is a, a wearable glasses that you have, and it has three modes of operations. It's got projected augmented reality. Um, best way that you describe, describe this to layman's is sort of a, a hologram-like image projected onto the surface in front of you. Or if you're Star Wars geeks like me, then you would see, remember the, the chess scene on the Millennium Falcon where they're playing hollow chess? It's a little bit like that, if I haven't set the bar too high already. <laughs> um, the second mode is AR, and that's more like Google Glass. And then the third mode is VR, which is more like Oculus. So um, with one product that's very comfortable and natural on your head, it fulfills all three of those different product features. The, the company is about uh, two years old now. The first year of the company, it was uh, being incubated within Valve Software uh, in their hardware labs. Our, our hardware co-founder, Jerry Ellsworth, was with the first hardware hire at Valve in their labs, and she discovered this through a, a unique story, which I'll save for a different talk. But, um, when Valve decided that they were going to uh, move towards more of a, a VR-style experience, um, her and Rick Johnson, the other co-founder, exited Valve and started Technical Illusions. Um, Gabe was generous and kind enough to allow us to bring the IP with us. So that was in February of last year. We demonstrated the product first at Maker Faire in April or May of, yeah, May, um, of last year, and we continue to make product iterations uh, to what you'll see and experience today here. The, um, we did run a Kickstarter campaign in November of last year, asking for about $400,000 in order to uh, build the product prototypes and get it ready for market. Uh, we raised 1.1 million, so that was a, a good thing. Um, and we've, with that money, we've been able, of course, to make additional improvements and get ready for market. We've also been able to bring on some additional staff. We're uh, glad to have Ken Clements here um, with Technical Legends as well. He's working with an RP. And he and I represent about a fifth of the company. We're a whole, uh, 10 people now, uh, with offices based up in Woodenville, Washington, which is right outside of Seattle, and then here in the Bay Area. The product itself, I'm going to go um, over real quick how it works, so that when we're doing the demos, I don't have to go, you know, go through this with each of you individually, but um, essentially we have micro projectors mounted above your eyes, and, and this is a, a mock-up of what a, a final unit will look like. The prototype with hot glue and exposed wiring will be over here. Uh, but eventually, you have a micro projection mounted above your eyes. They are 1280 by 720, running at 120 hertz, left eye and right eye. It will project the images off onto a retroreflective surface, which bounces the image back at your eyes. We have passive polarization glasses, um, lenses, which um, uh, helps with some of the crosstalk. And um, the resulting uh, 
experiences that hologram-like image floating in the surface in front of you. The, um, so we are tracking your head movements via a, a camera that's mounted on the bridge of your nose and it's reading a fiducial that's located in the environment that is pulsing out infrared LEDs that we're reading and then calculating your six, within six degrees of freedom um, and submillimeter accuracy where the glass is and where your head is located. So you'll be able to look around the, that object from whatever angle and position that you want to do. In fact, with multiple fiducials in the environment, you could essentially uh, take the retroflective surface while paper your entire room in this and have a holodeck style experience. It's pretty cool. Um, those are the three major components of the consumer experience. The projection on the glasses, the tracking, and the retroflective surface. We have a fourth component which we'll be shipping with our commercial units, and that's the uh, input wand. And it's a depth sensing wand that uses the same type of tracking that our glasses use. And we're not showing that here um, because it's still going through a product iteration right now. But um, so we'll have a, a gamepad that you can interact with the environment. But that's the, those are the four major components of the consumer experience. Um, and let's see, let's see, market-wise, okay, there's a lot of discussion about that over the last week, you know, as, as obviously Facebook identified a market that, um, that we didn't necessarily anticipate becoming uh, so important so soon. We're from the gaming industry, and our roots are in gaming, so we've designed the product and thought about the product from a gaming perspective. Um, and and when we're, we're embracing and working with the content developers out there to do that. That being said, there is an incredible opportunity in the vertical markets. There are times and places in which you, VR is not entirely appropriate. Um, take an, an example, an instructor. If you're instructing somebody and they're looking at their augmented environment and it's projected out in front of you, you want to be able to see the physical controls or the environment that you're, you're working with, with physical objects, while you're still able to see the instructor and still be in an immersive experience. Um, you want to be able to have mo mobility. Um, and be able to walk around an environment with an included view with a head-mounted display, it's very difficult to do. Um, there are times uh, in educational classrooms, um, medical environments, where, you know, again, an included view is just not appropriate. And then me as a gamer, I like to snack when I'm eating. In fact, I like to drink beer when I'm eating, or when I'm, when I'm gaming. So um, I, I, it's really hard to do with an Oculus on my face. So uh, this, this type of uh, augmented environment where you're still able to see the real world around you is very appropriate. Uh, but it happens to also solve a lot of other issues that people have with um, near-eye displays. The headaches or some nausea, um, no matter how many improvements occur, we still think that there's gonna be a, a portion of the population which has issues with that. We haven't had any difficulties with any of those headaches or nausea or any, it's a very comfortable and natural experience with Cast AR because you're focusing on natural focal length and you can, your, your, your brain is rooted in the environment around you while still seeing your augmentation. So it's a, a natural, comfortable experience. Um, I'll give a brief comment on some of the challenges as content developers. How many of you are content developers or creating things in AR and VR? Okay, so not a, a huge number, but a few. Um, a lot of the same challenges that you're gonna be dealing with in VR will apply to AR as well, especially projected AR. But the two major ones that we are always on our minds are user interface. How do you, you know, see a menu in that environment? How do you see labels and, um, and, uh, and other information? And then, of course, the, one of the most challenging one is input. How do you interact with that environment? And while virtual reality has its own unique view, we have to still think about that in, a, in an augmented way for our product, and when you deal with physical objects that may be placed into the scene, that becomes a, a little bit different type of input challenge as well. We've got a lot of suggestions for that. There's probably a whole talk of this in and of itself of um, the, the things that we've looked into, the anecdotes we've learned from developers, um, some of the best practices that are involved, but um, certainly from a design perspective, from software development, you, you want to keep those two things paramount in your mind. Uh, at this stage of the company, we're really about educating and letting you think about this for your next generation design of this kind of content. Uh, we'll have dev kits in the summertime, commercial units in Q4, so we're not too far away from getting your hands on this, and sometimes those lessons are best learned when you're actually interfacing with the product. But still, at this stage, we thought it was important for you to understand um, our views on some of the design considerations. So speaking of those next steps, obviously, dev kits is, is one thing that we always get questioned about. 
Um, we'll have a very limited number of dev kits. You know, as a hardware company, we obviously are going to be um, fulfilling our Kickstarter units first, and those are going to be happening in summer of this year. We'll have a few extra, so um, I'll be the person that will be speaking with the, the community to find out uh, what the right priorities are and what timing is um, in order to, to make sure we're, we're putting our, our select number of dev kits in the right hands. Um, and then the commercial units in Q4. Uh, another question that comes up is pricing. Um, and, and while it's not appropriate in this environment, I'm always curious to see what you would value this type of experience at. Um, the pricing for this, for the, the four components I talked about, the glasses, the tracking, the surface, and the input one, uh, in Q4, we're going to be shipping at a uh, sub $300 price point. So we want to keep it very consumer level. There are opportunities for us to enhance the technology in unique ways, uh, higher resolutions, uh, higher fields of view, things like that for vertical markets. And those, of course, would be priced according to what those markets um, would, would allow for. Um, and then we're going to obviously encourage you to take a look at the demo tonight. Uh, we're going to have it set up right after the talks. And um, I would ask, you know, with this size of group, that we try to limit it to maybe a minute or two. Uh, I will apologize in advance. We're taking our GDC demos. We're, we're running on some extremely powerful machines. Um, the, the demo was built up right before we showed up, tailored for that machine. I dumped it onto my laptop, which was a few years, old, a few years old, so the rendering is actually a little bit slower than I would like it to be. Um, so if you see any stuttering in, in, the, uh, in the image, it's probably actually due to the lag introduced by my rendering rather than anything else. But you can forgive me as much as you want or not. <laughs> I think you'll still find that the experience itself of the projection is pretty magical. Um, with that, I would like to open it up for about five minutes or so of Q and A, and let you guys ask any questions, please. So you mentioned the notion of being in a natural space like a classroom or a operating room, uh, but are you able to project AR without the retroreflective cloth, or would you still have to go and drape that over? In that environment. So the cloth is an integral portion of the projected augmented reality that we're talking about. So when I talk about a, um, a, a medical environment, it would perhaps be, be a doctor who's preparing to do surgery who looks over at a surface, um, which I think is being qualified actually now for operating room usage, and being able to see a three-dimensional object of who's about to cut into. Um, but uh, in the AR mode, of cast AR, we have a clip-on, which um, through a series of reflectors and optical expanders, uh, puts the image back on your eyes instead of projecting it out to the environment. And in that mode, you would be able to do that without markers or without the surface in the environment. But that's more of a, a, a full resolution, full field of view, Google Glass type of experience. Come on, this is your chance, please. Check the what, uh, what genre, what type of game you Oh, the fun question. I, I mean, I, everyone has their own opinion and views, of course. Uh, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a family guy, so I think of family game night with my kids and tabletop gaming, you know, playing Parcheesi or, or Mousetrap, you know, in three dimensions in front of, on the table in front of me. Uh, I've got friends who are sports gamers, and they want to be able to play FIFA or Madden on a tabletop in front of them our boxing game and have the boxers, you know, in three dimension on the table, you know, one, one port uh, view on the other. Um, speaking of, of, of gaming, one of the product features that I didn't, didn't mention, the retroreflective surface is very directional. So you could be wearing your pair of cast AR glasses, someone could be standing shoulder to shoulder next to you with their own pair of cast AR glasses, projecting your own views onto the surface, and you won't have any crosstalk, you'll, you'll only see your own individual images. So this presents an opportunity for incredible social gaming, um, collaborative or competitive environments. Uh, so so the, the game ideas are, are phenomenal. I think the best ideas, as probably with VR, will come once you get your hands on a product and, and you think, this is how I would design something for this experience. But we've, we've played first person shooters, driving, flight sims, and other types of games, RTSs in this environment. You know, Minecraft would be really cool to be able to you know, the, the navigate and look around in three dimensions. Um, but the sky's the limit. Have you played around with having like a semi-transparent reflective surface that hangs in front of your eyes so that you can actually see through it and also reflect off of it and, and kind of do the math to make the object appear in 3D space? The question being a semi, I haven't tried it with a semi-reflective environment. Yeah. Um, we've done a lot of really clever and interesting things in our labs, which we're not talking about yet. <laughs> Thank you for your question. Next. <laughs> Are 
Are Last question. Are you guys showing off the VR clip-on yet? Sorry again? Are you guys showing off the VR clip-on yet? The VR clip-on we have not disclosed yet. Um, uh, we're, we're very proud of it. It's, it's, a, it's a pretty cool experience. But we're letting the people who are taking the lead in VR talk about VR. We're taking the lead in projected AR, and we're talking about that. So we're, we're, we're demonstrating um, and, and trying to get people thinking about the projected augmented reality and the, the unique nature of our product. Um, but yes, the VR experience is, is pretty interesting. Okay. All right, thanks so much for your time, and I look forward to seeing you guys in the up. Okay, yeah. so while Sebastian gets set up here, we've got that, we've got a link. Okay. So, so, Sebastian is one of the first people that I heard talking about the democratization of VR, which is something near and dear to my heart, and uh, he's got a website for many years now, I believe, devoted to this idea, so that is um, pretty excited that he's here to speak to us tonight. Um, while he gets set up, um, Actually, no, I'll, let, let's, let's let you get into it, and then I'll make my comment next. <laughs> okay. okay, you're all set. Thank you very much for coming all today. Um, I always tell that we're at the prehistory of VR, and I think this week was really the big bang of VR. So the VR universe is quickly expanding, and when I got into VR, I hoped it was like that 12 years ago, but it was not. I was quite disappointed, but at least it's coming now, and we can have fun now. So my name is Sebastian Kunz. I'm uh, the founder and president of a software company in VR called I'm in VR. And our goal is to simplify VR on the software side so that you can focus on creating games and applications. So we have a VR plugin called Middle VR, which allows you to create VR applications more simply. We'll talk about it just after that. And it's currently completely integrated into Unity. We are also starting a new, Sorry. also starting a new, new new branch, which will be called a Studio VR, which is a, a development studio for creating games and service applications. Also, so the Middle VR project started four years ago, and uh, we already have, have quite a few clients all around the world. It's mostly academics and professionals. So I started my career in VR twelve years ago at the French Railways, working on uh, training simulators to train uh, on different aspects. And then I joined VirTools, which was a very popular 3D engine back in the time. So if you were using 3D five to 10 years ago, maybe you heard about that. So I was in charge of adding VR to this 3D engine. I was also elected a member of the French VR Association, AFRB. And I recently discovered this picture of me when I was a little kid. It <laughs> seems I was interested in him this play for longer than I thought. Five or four years ago, I tried to build my own head-mounted display also, so sticking a music inside a ski mask. So that's how we did VR before the Oculus. Also did a sort of cave in my very small Parisian apartment, which worked really well. I've been working on a few games prototypes also. Many different things, just to have fun. And we were also creating the, maybe the first VR meetups for, for the, five years ago we, with an association called the VR Geeks. So we, we met regularly trying everything we could, but there was not so much new things apart from what we were doing. But let's come back to VR. So, I have a very long definition of what VR is for me, and you can read it in an article I wrote in Gamma Sutra. But the short version is that you, I think you should feel present in the virtual world and completely forget about the real world. This leads to natural interactions and natural reactions. So if I throw a ball at you, you will have the reflex to catch it. And if the sound is too loud, you will have to... Can you pull it up a little bit? Just pull it closer to you. Yeah, that's it. 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 
spectateurs like this. Yeah. OK. I will keep the French accent there. <laughs> Good to have back. So you can be immersed in VR, either via head-mounted displays, big VR screens, or caves. How many of you have tested a cave? Good. So a cave is basically a room, and all of the walls of the room are stereoscopic screens. So for example, that's basically the holodeck, and that's, that's the cave that we have in our office. And that's a very impressive environment. You have very high resolution, very low latency, and very high field of view. So if you have a chance to test a cave one day, test it. That's a very interesting experience and a different experience than a multi displays. Really also, recently I've been able to test all three of Sony Morpheus, Oculus DK2, and Valve's prototypes. So if you want to talk about it, I have some feedback, but Valve is much better. <laughs> and in my definition of VR, you have to look ridiculous. If you don't ridiculous, look ridiculous, it's probably not real VR. <laughs> so a famous scientist once said that VR works because reality is virtual. So bear with me for one or two slides, and then we'll get back to fun stuff. If you think about it, you don't have access to the real reality. You have to you access reality through your senses, through your full, uh, flawed senses. Think about how optical illusions can fool you into seeing something that does not exist. Also, if you take drugs or if you dream, it will create illusions. It will create perceptions. So I don't know, I only know about dreams, but... <laughs> also, you may think about uh, the allegory of the cave by philosopher Plato, in which he says that you cannot access the real reality. You are, you are only, you, don't, you cannot see the real objects that are behind you. You cannot only see the shadows of the objects. And these shadows are not completely not perfect. And this will be useful for later. Keep this in mind. So I don't think we should oppose reality to virtual reality. I think we should oppose natural reality to virtual reality. And for the brain, it's all just a different reality. So this is the most complicated slide. Hang up. So this is your brain. Basically, this feeling of presence, which for me defines what VR is, has, can be said to have two levels. So first, you have the cognitive presence. This happens when you're reading a book, when you're playing a game, when you're hearing a story or watching a movie. What VR is really adding to that is the low level of presence, like the lizard brain. It's fooling the senses, fooling the vision, the ears, the nose, the touch. And when you get this perfect feeling of presence, this is where you can start to train people, that you can start to cure people, that you can start to have fun and have natural reactions. That's what VR is, and that's the only thing that VR can add this. That's the only media that can add this. So, uh, probably most of you think that VR is, has been dying for the last 20 years, and you think it's reborn now. Actually, it, never died on the academic or professional side. The current market is estimated at $100 million, so that, that was before next week. <laughs> <laughs> Peugeot, for example, the car manufacturer has been invested 7 million euros in VR since 99. Renault just bought a new 3 million euro cave. And these numbers are probably completely off by now, but it's going to be a big market. And I think VR currently is being used not to escape reality, but really to improve reality by saving time, saving money, and mostly save lives also. I will not take too much time to talk about the current professional applications. This, I could talk about VR for hours, so the car will not be happy. But basically, you can use VR to design uh, and test cars, boats, tractors, even house appliances. And that's very useful and that's really a powerful tool for designers. That's also a great tool for marketing study. You can create virtual supermarkets and really test the design and impact of design without having to build a real supermarket. You can also create virtual showrooms. So instead of having one big giant warehouse in which you have all the different products with all the different variations, different colors, different options, 
you can just have one VR system in which you can show all the different options. It's also a great tool to train people. That's where I come from. Training people in VR, you can train them for any kind of gesture, like surgeons. You can train them for dangerous situations. You can train them, train them for rare. And you can repeat gestures until this is really mastered. You can have analysis replay of the, all the gestures. And it's cheaper and it saves material. I can talk to you about that later. Also, if you have fear of the spiders, if you have fear of taking the plane, fear of uh, heights, we can cure you thanks to VR. We can put you in an environment in which you have your phobia, and you will have your real phobia. Even if I'm not subject to fear of heights, if I go in near a high cliff in VR, I have fear of heights. So this is a great tool for therapists, because it's a controlled environment. They can avoid increasing the, the phobia, and they can use it to cure you. VR is mainly a software problem. And really, I think software is like a fuel for your car. You can have great hardware, and lots of people are doing great hardware, but they have to have software running on this. So this is where we come, come in. So middle VR is a generic VR plugin. It's a C++ SDK, which will handle any kind of input device, 3D trackers, keyboard, mouse, joystick, haptics, force feedbacks. And manage any kind of display. So it can be hand mounted display, it can be case, 3D TVs, anything you want. And we also provide high level building blocks such as interactions, GUIs, menu. You will see that in a moment. So really, our goal are to simplify VR when, you, when you're creating your application and when you want to use your application on many different VR systems. It's also used to add VR to different 3D engines. So currently, it's implemented into Unity, but it can be used to add VR to any 3D engine. So it comes with a nice graphical user interface that allows you to configure quickly any kind of VR system. And this is a, a very quick tutorial. So that's a basic Unity demo. Maybe some of you have played with it. So it's fun. You can just throw stuff away. You cannot do this in real life. <laughs> so we're going to make this <coughs> VR compatible by just adding one component. Then you can choose which VR system you want to use, and you press play. And we'll start with a, just moving the camera with a Razer Hydra. Then I can export my application, and without changing the application, I can choose to have it play on Oculus Rift. Maybe I can choose to add a lip motion also to interact. And the same application without modification can also run on a big VRK. So this one is my favorite. It's 10 meters wide, 16 projectors just for the front face. I love it. But it's a bit more expensive. <laughs> so quickly, we support any kind of input tracker that you might think of, even those that don't exist yet. Uh, virtually any hand-mounted display, case, 3D TVs, etc. We're also adding more high-level building blocks that you can use to create your applications is more easily, like different ways of navigating in your scene, different ways of selecting and manipulating objects. What we are also working on right now is having menus so that you can really easily have immersive menus. Also working on having web pages display in VR so that you can have videos running, you can have any HTML5 rendering. And this can be used for having your graphical user interface, like sliders, button, everything created in HTML5, which is a standard development tool that you can use. The new version 1.4 has a free edition for non-commercial use that allows you to use Oculus Rift, Motion, Kinect, so that you can mix everything together. And you can download it right away. It's, it's already working. A quick video of what I'm going to demonstrate tonight. That's a game that we created in 48 hours. So be kind. But we really wanted to try. Come on. Hello. Don't be shy. No? Ah, yes. So this is basically a remix of Lemmings. So some of you may remember Lemmings. So you have to save these stupid animals that are going to bed by saving them. So we really wanted to explore the basics of what a VR game can be. 
I think a lot of people are trying to do things that are overly ambitious and we're trying to focus on the basics of what a good VR game could be. This is simple, but it works. I want to finish with some unexplored secret ninja techniques. Maybe some of you have heard about all those, but... So before that, we were talking about how we perceive illusion through our imperfect senses. For example, our senses are not very sensitive. If I put you on a ch rotating chair, I blind you. And if I have you rotate very slowly, you will not feel that you're rotating because I'm moving very slowly. Or also, you're, you only perceive what your uh, attention is, where your att attention is. So how can we take advantage of this to improve VR applications? There is one illusion that is called redirected walking. So in VR, the problem is that if I put you in a hand-mounted display and ask you to walk straight, at one point you will hit the wall. What we can do, we put you in a hand-mounted display, we ask you to walk straight, and you will be able to walk for miles and miles and miles. But what you will be actually doing in real life is walking in circles. But you will not be able to, to, not to feel it because the circle will be big enough so that you are not feeling it. Another one is change blindness. <coughs> What's really nice is if you come on the corridor here through the blue door, you do stuff on the desk, and while your attention is on the desk, we change the door, door's position. And in the real life, doors don't change position, so you're not really aware of how, what's happening. So when you get back, you were working in this direction, and when you get out, you're working in other direction. So we can really have you work in circle also, even though you're thinking you're working along a big corridor. So you can see that in action here. This is a video from um, USC in California. So the girl thinks she's walking along a big corridor and really going into different rooms that you can see above. But really, she's walking in circle. And I've tested it, and that's creepy. <laughs> What's really happening is, in blue, this is the real world. So you're walking here, going inside here, and also doing stuff here. And while you're doing stuff here, this room here, the virtual room, will really extend to here. So when you get out, you're not getting out here in the real room, you're getting out here. But you think you're really getting out here. So really you're going here and here and here. Huh. And you don't notice it. <laughs> Last example would be also, this works for touch, because our brain is mostly dominated by what we see. So if in a real world I put a flat table, and in the virtual world I'm showing you a rotated table, if you touch the flat table, and in the real world I show you a virtual hand that is moving along, along the rotated table, your brain will think that what you're actually touching in real life is rotated, although it's not. How cool is that? <laughs> <laughs> so what's nice is that you can play with um, the limitations of human perception, and this can be used to lower the cost and the complexity of VR systems. And remember that we are really working with the human brain, so we have to understand how the brain works, how perception works. That's really the key for a good VR. <coughs> yes, that's the end of it. You can have next talk very soon. Just take away Needle VR is a great VR plugin, fully integrated in Unity, simplify the creation of VR applications, deployment on many different VR systems, adaptable to many different hardware and also many different software. And Studio VR is a development studio for applications and games, and we can also help you create your games and applications. <coughs> Thank you very much. One question. <laughs> yes. So, in the plugin work for Unity, any plans or chance you're going to have to be able to get this Yes, now that Unreal has a nice business model and we have access to source code, we will start working on it. That was a two quick question. Second question. A question? Good, okay. Thank you all for your attention.
think that uh, Jared and Lanier quote is uh, especially timely that VR is mainly a software problem and I think that's one of the things that we can take away from the Facebook acquisition is that um, Oculus has has uh, solved to some extent the hardware problem of creating an HMV, but they saw that the larger problem and the larger opportunity is in the platform, is in the software behind that. And that one, one of the things I'm thankful for, I guess, about this acquisition is that now we can start having that conversation about the metaverse instead of screen resolutions, because the conversation about the metaverse is much more interesting and much more powerful and uh, that's where the real opportunities are, I think, in this space. And, and with that, that leads us in perfectly to high fidelity. So if we are concerned, worst case scenario, about a Facebook metaverse, I think high fidelity is the best alternative for a open, I believe you're open source, completely open source, and, and, and an open metaverse that has um, Built-in privacy, built-in economy. <laughs> so, for those of you who don't know, Phil Rosedale was the uh, creator of the founder of Linden Lab and the creator of Second Life, which was probably the real first serious attempt at a metaverse at some sort of open metaverse. And it is still going strong. At one point, I know the economy of Second Life was $600 million annually. I think that's about right, roughly, which is, they had kitchens, they made bathrooms in their homes and beds, you know, things they don't need, roofs over their house. They made nightclubs where they went and you know, danced together. A lot of interesting human behavior, I think you can get out of looking at Second Life. So it looks like you guys are about ready. We are. All right. <laughs> Thank you. All right. So take it away. Um, Thank you. you want to try? Uh, we're going to go through here. Oh, you have your own PA. All right. We. That's an easy. But, all right. All right. Hello, Hello, everybody. everybody. Thank, Thank you, Carl. Carl. Uh, thanks, thanks, everybody, for having uh, us here. Hang on one second. Boom. There we go. So, uh, obviously no slides. We are, we at High Fidelity are just getting ready to start our alpha program. We've got a bunch of people, probably some people in here that are on that list. We've let uh, just a handful of people log in in the last few weeks to sort of make sure for what we've got working right now, things are running. And uh, rather than... Uh, well, well, rather, rather than, than say much about what our plan is, is, I did that last time I was here. Let me just show you a little bit of what we've got going on in the Alpha program live right now. So, uh, my hands. Oh, I don't think I plugged it in. Oh, wait, one more plug. Just one more plug. Uh, okay, wait a second. My hands. Here come my hands. It's waking up. My hands are waking up. My hands are waking up. Oh, oh there they are. My hands are here. My hands are calibrated. They're in front of me. So, so look. Fundamentally, uh, we believe, with high fidelity. Uh, I believe that sensors, uh, not just things like the Oculus, but more specifically. Uh, uh, devices, devices, as, as you're seeing here, that are able to capture my movement, my, my, my facial expressions, my eye movement, looking, looking at you. Sensors, sensors like these are about to revolutionize uh, what we're doing in virtual reality. I think for a lot of reasons, and I'm going to show you some of these, uh, being able to use these devices to make the process of getting into a virtual world and the actual qualitative experience of being there fundamentally uh, different, different is, is going, going to take, take us from the million, million people that are using Second Life today to a billion people using something that we're all going to build together. So let me just show you a couple of crazy pieces uh, of that. So when I say qualitatively different, uh, the first thing is the experience of talking to somebody else is going to be completely different. And here is a somebody else. I, Emily. 
Hey there, Philip. How are you? <laughs> hey, everybody. A little more. <laughs> Good to see you. Hello. So, Emily, uh, welcome. Welcome to SVVR. Um, Thank you. <laughs> Emily uh, works at High Fidelity for us and uh, has spent, well, her first time in virtual reality in the last like, year or so, Emily? Yeah. Yeah, pretty much. And uh, among other things, Emily has spent every Friday with the rest of us in our company meetings, which are roundtables where we are doing exactly this, where, well, where I'm looking into the screen or into Emily's eyes as I am here. And, and she's talking to us. So I mean, one thing I was going to say. Well, Emily, what is it? What does it feel like? What's different between? What's What's it like to be an avatar now that you've done it so much? I actually find it really enjoyable. I uh, I really like to watch. Get really expressive. And <laughs> it's uh, I definitely uh, miss the facial expression if if the camera's not on, and it's it's a totally different experience. I just love it. <laughs> So, in terms of showing you this, what, what, what's a good moment that you've seen at a company meeting? What, what comes into your mind? Hmm. I just love the alpha meetups. It's the last couple of uh, meetups that we've had just do show and tell. And uh, one of the things that comes to mind actually is the, uh, the xylophone. When, uh, when you first brought that out and you showed us how to, uh, to make different noises on different colored voxels, it was just mind blowing. <laughs> I can actually show some of that today. That was one of the first things we did with the, uh, with, with, with our hands, basically being in world. Now talk, in, talk, in, talk, whisper into my ear, Emily. Wait, wait, wait. Can you say something? Can you hear me on this side? <laughs> a little louder. It's, we don't have it that. Out. Here we go. Okay. Can you hear me on this side? <laughs> so one of the things that's crazy about this is the whole world of high fidelity is. Completely spatial. And we're going to show you a crazy, crazy. But we're going to show you. Ah! We're, going we're going to show you a crazy demo of that in a second. We had to punch a hole in the Dojo network here, or change our software a little to run on it, so it may come in and out a little bit. But basically, uh, first of all, the me that you're hearing and the Emily that you're hearing are happening with a latency of about 100 milliseconds. Your cell phone has a latency of 500. A voice over IP system is 700, 900. So Emily and I can cut each other off. She can nod. We can, we can look at each other uh, in ways because of that 100 milliseconds that you just can't do with anything else. So this, we think, is, along with the sensor devices, is totally revolutionary in terms of capabilities. Um, so let's see. That's great. Um, <laughs> It's just totally intoxicating to like watch yourself and watch somebody else when you're talking to them. You, you've also seen that when I move in front of the screen, I can, I can look around Emily, not with the Oculus, but just by doing that in front of the screen. Because, and that was the trick I was showing you with her talking into my ear. You can't kind of tell without a headphone on, but basically when I'm moving back and forth in front of my team and you're listening to each other, you're hearing the audio change just like it does in the real world. Audio is a huge, huge part of virtual reality. It's not uh, nobody's working on it enough. It's one of the things that I always, you know, put out there whenever I'm talking to people about it. So we started with audio, with mixing in uh, all this audio together. And uh, I want to show you, well, let me show you a couple other things, just in terms of capabilities. So thank you. Thank you, Emily. I'll hang out here with us and we can make a mess of things a little bit. Um, so, so. The feeling of talking to Emily is one thing, but what about building in the virtual world? Well, the, the other thing that's different, right, is you can build in Second Life, uh, you know, you know by, by clicking on things and dragging and turning. You can do the same thing in AutoCAD. But if I hit the keys here, right? Oh, wait. I'll turn on my little building tool here. Right? You know, drawing something like, uh, I guess I could go around Emily there. Oh, that's crazy. I've never done that. You know, I mean, I'm doing this with, I'm, I'm, I'm building voxels there, solids that, you know, she can see the same as I can. Basically, in, in the world, in real time, you know, I can, I can click down there and switch the colors. Now, one of the things that you'll see when you jump into our alpha is uh, everything here, this tool that I'm showing you, uh, the way that it maps the motions of my hands of the Hydra to stuff in the world, is done completely in JavaScript. So, 
This, this is a this is literally a JavaScript file called edit voxels that has support in it for the Hydra controllers, and they're being drawn in. That little UI down at the bottom of the screen. Emily, you can click on something there if you want, like delete some of the voxels. Of course, Emily can edit this thing at the same time as I do. I can do it by clicking. Just keep sort of building things here myself. Um, let's see. Another thing about our system is. Blocks, so it's a bit like what you're seeing right now is a bit like Minecraft, but imagine a Minecraft where you can make the blocks smaller. This is where the thing we're missing with controllers is not having to hold. Um, you know, and then start digging, but uh, the fundamental way our system is designed is around uh, an octree, a voxel system in which those blocks can be infinitely subdivided. They can be as big as the whole world itself and as small as an atom. Uh, and so that's another part of our system. Now there's a lot of other things you can do with JavaScript and with these controllers. And you know, if you look at Second Life, Carl was mentioning the big economy that it has of people buying and selling things from each other. Imagine what that's going to be like when we can build things that uh, at 60 frames per second work as well as things like this. So for example, uh, let's see, I'm going to load some JavaScript that we've built and we're helping, hoping with help our alpha users, we'll, you're going to soon see a big catalog of lots and lots more objects that are built this way. So here I can back up and here's one called ball. Now with this, I can throw balls at Emily. It was well protected by this wall. Hey. <laughs> Here? Uh, one got stuck. <laughs> <laughs> then, uh, but of course, better watch out, Emily, because I can stop the toy ball script and just go straight for the guns. <laughs> Weren't you all thinking that? Where's the gun? Time to gun. There's the gun. So now, sorry, Emily. Oh, great. Um, and what's better is the gun blows holes in the voxels. So I'm going to get through to Emily there. So really, really powerful system where you can use JavaScript uh, and objects. We can also do objects that are models as well, so fully rendered 3D. Obviously, Emily there is not made of voxels. She's made of triangles. Again, Again, before going back to that latency thing, I've never done this. This is the first time we've ever done this. You're hearing me bouncing off our servers. So you're hearing me at about 90 milliseconds later. We've done tests on this. What you'll notice, right, is at least for you guys, it turns out it's a little harder for me to do this. I'm kind of trained in it. Uh, look at my lips and listen. This is exactly what it's going to feel like when you're talking to somebody in the virtual world. Because I'm, there's a feature we have called loopback where I'm playing this audio through exactly as Emily's hearing it. Fantastic. Uh, the last, let's see, what else am I going to show you here? JavaScript, okay. So I mentioned before you can, you can break up these voxels. Well, breaking up the voxels also lets us break up the servers. So the world itself, and don't look over there, I'm going to show you that in a minute. That's our, that's our big finale. I'm going to fly. Uh, we've intentionally got not very much stuff in the world right now, so we're kind of flying around in space. but. As I fly closer over here, what are we going to see show up as I get closer with a little luck here? Those little blocks off in the distance. Ah, I'm not moving. Oh, I clicked off. Are actually a whole other set of several million voxels back there, David. And David there is running on a completely different small server. So what we're building here is a vision around an internetwork of virtual worlds. Not just one virtual world, but many virtual worlds that may be abutting in some cases or connected to each other via links and portals. But uh, the architecture we've built is one in which the voxels, the audio you're hearing, the movement of my body as an avatar, those are being handled by a sort of a constellation of small servers where each server can be dedicated to a different small embeddable region of the world. And you can have a city that has smaller servers inside it for apartments and smaller servers inside there for your closet or the terrarium where you've got fish swimming around. Around, 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 around. Come back. Um, there, there, I'm back. So, you know, and I can shoot holes in David, not very nice. 
And of course, if it belongs to somebody else's server, it may not let me do that, but the whole world is, is, is interacting that way. Okay, let me, let me look at my list here. So, so, so where are all these servers going to come from? Well, obviously, when you fire up High Fidelity right now, if you join our alpha program, you can run what we call the local stack that puts this whole thing, this whole experience on your laptop. You, you can, can log, log into the alpha servers, servers, which is a great big shared space in which we have many, many different connected servers. servers. Um, but, where but where are we going to get all these servers? servers? Well, we've, we've designed our architecture so, so that uh, the servers are, and, and, and the other, other thing is we've been able to take advantage of how fast the internet is today. These, these servers, servers are actually, uh, late, late, the latency to our homes today is low enough that the servers are going to come from all of us. So not only are you going to run your own little chunk of the virtual world on a server in your apartment, what you're actually going to do beyond that is when you go to sleep, when you stop using that virtual world, you're going to run what we technically call today an assignment client, which is going to use your computer as part of the simulated virtual world. It's going to store those voxels and serve them to you from that one little machine. Uh, if there's a great big shared public space, there's going to be machines that are borrowed from all of us while we're sleeping to simulate the world. And, and I, I want to give you a demonstration. So what can you do with that? Well, you can store parts of the virtual world on those servers, but you can also run pets and simulations and uh, uh, interactive objects or even things like relighting the world you can do all that essentially with these little machines, these little assignments. And I want to give you the final demo here that's, that's crazy that we just got working yesterday, so we're pretty excited about it. And it brings, 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 brings you back to all this sound stuff. So I'm going I'm I'm to come over here to our little nightclub that we built, that we'll probably keep open. And what you're going to experience, with a little luck here, is about 50 different little machines, individual processes, that are uh, simulating the space, but each one of these, as I'm going to show you, is, oops, boy, shoot somebody. Hopefully that won't happen when I go inside the club here. So listen. You'll start here. Wow, I'm not even close enough yet. Of course, all the sound is spatialized. So that little guy up there playing the music is one little borrowed machine. How cool is this? Now let me explain what's happening down there. So there's 40, there's 40 little avatars down there, and each one is running on a separate device. Uh, it's actually running on a separate thread in one of our servers right now, but we've done this on our cell phones. And, and by the way, a dancing avatar is a perfect thing to do with a cell phone um, in terms of bandwidth and computation capability. But here's what's a trip. Watch them dancing. You'll see they're responding to my voice, which I'm going to get closer and show you. It's the funnest thing. Each one of them is receiving a full about 700 kilobit audio stream same stream we're listening to. And the latency in the system is so low, we've programmed them to kind of be a little resonator that just samples the music rather than playing it out on any speakers and moves around according to that. They're also moving their joints. The joints are fully articulated, uh, so you can move, uh, you can build any skeleton, load it into here, and then move it in any way that you want. And if I get close to them, you can see that mixed audio really works. So, <laughs> the closest ones to me actually jump up in the air like that, while the rest of them are listening to the DJ music that they can hear. So that's pretty crazy. I mean, I don't know. As, as, even as the creator of Second Life, when we got that working, we got this working yesterday with all the movement and everything, I was just like, this is a crazy, great moment. So that's about where we are in Alpha. We're just, we're just starting. We're inviting uh, people that are hopefully have a bit more of a development sensibility or content creation capabilities to come in with us in a relatively small group and start building experiences like this and just see how far we can go with it. Um, we don't think there are a lot of limits. The network latencies are low enough to allow this presence, uh, as Sebastian very aptly said, this, this actual sense of connection and immersion with somebody. The machines are so fast, we don't even know what to do with them to slow them down. I mean, 
We can run so many little people like this on even a single home PC, it's just ridiculous. We have so many megabits of transit available, we don't even know what to do with it. I think our machines are in so many ways surpassing us now, and I think the payoff for virtual reality is going to be just uh, absolutely crazy. I'm trying to think if I missed anything here. Um, what are we, you might wonder, what are we going to do as a company? I'm going to stop, take a few questions, but what are we going to do as a company? We're going to build a, a, a couple of network layers that you're not going to have to use, but that we hope you probably will use. Things like unique names. This club has a single location, a single text name in the whole virtual world. We will run, as a company, those servers. You will run and share all these uh, uh, all these different devices that are simulating the world. And another thing I didn't touch on is uh, we will build a new currency, um, very possibly a new uh, cryptocurrency actually, to deploy to allow everyone to recognize the uh, contribution that you're making of these server machines. So that there's basically a fluid economy like there is around goods and services in Second Life, but now one that actually includes the server and equipment layer itself uh, in the virtual world. So that's basically kind of where we're going. We'll also build, we hope to build the, the, the tools or the marketplace itself that allows you to uh, buy and sell things, for example, across all these different inter-network virtual worlds. And so that's basically the big idea of where we're going. Um, there's an alpha sign up on our site. Um, if you haven't, and you're in here, if you haven't already and you'd like to, sign up for it. We have a Mac build right now. We don't even have our Windows auto building yet, although you can build it on Windows yourself. Um, we also have a thing called Worklist. Uh, you can find it up highfidelity.io, but there's a thing we've built called Worklist.net, which is a site where we put up tons and tons of uh, smaller jobs that we need done in building this software. Uh, we, we've worked on this for a long time uh, and are very passionate about you know, embracing a large community of participants in building this. Uh, open source and open standards and open protocols are just one piece of it. The kind of middle layer we think is actually engaging people in building the thing side by side with us. Uh, because as I can't remember who famously said, you know, all the smart people in something can't possibly work for your company. You know, you don't have money. It might not be a big enough market. Uh, so we're going to do all those things. We're also hiring uh, developers, community managers, uh, product managers, uh, you know, people again with that kind of experience and interest. So uh, I hope this is a kind of a fun demo of, of what we're doing. And um, uh, we're going to be able to demo it to you after this. We've got, we have a couple of machines. We have a couple of machines set up uh, at the table here and you'll be able to jump in and do what I'm doing right now or actually put the headphones on or the, the Oculus actually. You can actually use the Oculus, thank you Carl. And uh, talk to me or somebody else uh, face to face like we just did. So happy to show you all this. Uh, maybe a couple questions or thank you very much. Question. Keep myself virtual, it's so weird. How do you envision HMD configuration with the Yeah, so what about the HMDs? Um, we, uh, it's losing me. We have had the Oculus working from the very beginning. Uh, I was down in Irvine recently seeing the absolutely unbelievable latest stuff they've been doing. Um, I think the HMD is definitely, for many people that are in a world like High Fidelity, going to be the, you know, the, the, the visual access point for it. Um, but, I, but I do think that 3D TVs, these cameras and their ability to capture motion, uh, as I said at the very beginning, the sensor devices, the actual, I believe the actual hand detection and skeletal and body detection is actually the most... Uh, disruptive part of the innovation here and that's why I think uh, companies like Sixth Sense that are working in that area are probably going to like unlock more undiscovered potential for these systems. I mean just being able to play with JavaScript like I have been tonight you know and shoot things and move these hands around it's just it's as a developer it's one of those things where you just feel like my god we're gonna be working on this for 20 years we're not even gonna be done with it all. So. Back there? Yeah. yeah. Um, we actually have a, a, a 3D based solution for 
the face detection, and we also have a 2D-based solution that is actually in the product now. So if you fire it up, your eyes will get even even more twitchy when we're having to use the inboard camera to detect what your face is doing. I basically think in the next year or two, you're going to see a lot of improvements. The twitching eyes is something that we've worked on quite a bit. It turns out, and it's a weird thing, you can come and see it here, it turns out that linking is a huge part of one-on-one -on -one communication. Really interesting. We, we blink to indicate a lot more stuff than is obvious. Uh, so as soon as you get blinking, so we're always focused on making blinking work, and we're to we're willing to tolerate even if it's a little funny looking. But it is a it is a hard line. And I that's good feedback. Yeah, look, some of them. Yeah, my eyes can't close all the way on this uh, rig as well. Yes, sir. So is the JavaScript library that, that you're going to be using, is it relied on 3JS or something for the physics, or is you can plug in whatever you want, or? It's a good question. So the JavaScript library, how's it going to work? Um, well, the basic JavaScript library, we're writing our own calls for things like getting information about what the hands are doing, writing 2D overlays on the screen, like those little uh, UI elements down there. What we hope to do if you're talking about something like 3.js, 3 3 3 since, since that's basically a wrapper on OpenGL, I'm not, not sure as much how, how much it'll make sense to like load 3.js and let you use it. That would be straightforward. Um, what we're really excited about is, well, things like physics, but also things like WebGL. One of our visions is that anything that runs in WebGL, you should just be able to drag and drop the JavaScript into here and have it actually in the virtual world. That's one of the things that we're working on. That doesn't work today. That's one of the directions we're definitely going to go in. Our, our, our goal, you see all these voxels and different things we're doing, but at the level of the content development, our thinking is you just got to support the standards that have the most content built around them. So our avatars are FBX files. You can build any avatar you want. Um, I mean, we'll probably impose domain operators, server operators like us, we'll, we'll probably impose some logical upper limits on like how big your avatar file can be, how many LOD layers it has to have. But basically, we're just using full-on triangles and textures to build uh, these characters as compared to something like Second Life. Yes. Yep. Yep. So, so the Uncanny Valley, uh, we, how, everybody here knows what the Uncanny Valley is, right? The Uncanny Valley becomes even more uncanny when it's you. <laughs> Looking at yourself in the mirror is really weird. Now the good thing about it is that you tend to be less critical because there's that weird, the thing that started the company was we actually built this way to kind of look at ourselves in a mirror. And we were so blown away by how connected you got to that movement if it was approximately correct and had low latency. But yes, uh, my answer to that is I'm not sure. I think that we're just barely getting good enough to jump across if you do the right design of the avatar. I'll tell you right now, if you do a photorealistic face on me, like, like many of you have seen, you know, like obviously there's many, many beautiful static avatars that have photorealistic faces. We've, We've done, done this, and I move it like I'm moving this one, it'll scare the hell out of you. You'll run out of you. Um, but this sort of anime face that's kind of halfway between expressive, so that look, I can, you know, I can, give you a, I can give you a little bit of key expression, but it's not too much. The fact that I have a beard is part of that design philosophy. Like, we're that into this stuff. We found that. The, the facial, facial hair makes it a lot easier. You, you, I, you'd get a chance tonight to meet Ryan, who's my co-founder. He usually is the guy on the other end of the circuit. We were lucky enough to get Emily uh, tonight, but Ryan is usually the guy who does it. He has this avatar that's just inexplicably wonderful. None of us understand why. We built it, and it just... It, it's, it's just a super cool avatar, avatar but, it's but it's the total, total uncanny, uncanny valley issue. Somehow, somehow and, it, and, it, and it totally looks like him. Somehow, somehow he just nailed it. Yes. I don't, I don't, it's a good question. Our thinking is not to put ads in anything. I think there's that, there's something about ads. It's a different direction to go as a company. What we're thinking is more that we'll be VeriSign, PayPal, uh, a marketplace, uh, eBay, if you will, for the virtual world, but not uh, AdWords. 
I suspect, though, that what will happen, and this happened a little bit in Second Life, is people will build their ad networks. Ad, sorry, ad networks, networks in the world. In the world. But, I but I don't think that we as a platform provider will do that. Although I, I guess I shouldn't rule it out. I mean, it's early. But uh, I mean, I think someday you're going to see advertisements in the virtual world, same as you do here. I just don't know what the infrastructure pieces of that will be and whether in, in a futuristic sense there will be like a single large player like we have with Google today. I don't know. Are you, yes. are you funding this through Second Life, or is this like a whole new venture? So the question is, how is this funded? Totally new venture. Our investors are Google and True Ventures. We had a funding announcement yesterday, in fact, that just got picked up in the wire. Not a big deal, but we've, we've got great partners, uh, Google and True. We've raised a good bit of money already. Uh, we, we announced we'd raised another $2.5 million uh, yesterday, and we I mean, I don't anticipate that funding the software piece of this, which is really where our energy is focused, is going to be that difficult. Because I think, happily, we already have a lot of evidence with things like Second Life that this can be done, this can happen. And so I think that's uh, making it possible for us to build this in a way that in 1999, when I was starting Linden Lab, I mean, it was a lot harder. I had to invest in the company for the first couple of years completely out of my pocket. We simply couldn't have done it. And then my great mentor and our first investor, Mitch Capor, was the guy who came along and had the vision. He's always had the vision like that to just say, I believe, you know, I know these guys are going to do something amazing. But I think today we're, we're a little closer to the right place. People are ready. <laughs> I'm, I'm totally trying not to strike a pose, you know, when you can see the... <laughs> Anything, Anything else? else? Any, Any other questions? questions? Are you going to try to merge your previous like existing worlds, like the worlds that people built into this world? Like the people who are obsessed with you know, Second Life now, are they going to go, oh, I can't wait to enter this sort of virtual world with my existing world? Well, well when I say I believe in an internet network of virtual worlds, you know, I don't think any of us, even those of us here, understand once this all starts to work, how large a space set of interactions, people using it, we're talking about. I think we're talking about the same scale as the consumer internet today, eventually. Can I say how long that is? Even if I had an answer, you wouldn't want to listen to me because I'm one of the enthusiasts who believe that since you know, 1986 or something. But I do think it's going to be absolutely huge. And what I think that means actually is that the growth of content year over year is going to so dwarf the sum of all history exponential growth part of virtual worlds that we're, it's not even going to matter, you know what I mean? Like happily, I think like everything in the Google warehouse, everything in Second Life, everything in uh, Turbo Squid will just be sucked up into this expanding network of systems that people are putting online as if, you know, a drop of water in an ocean. I think that we're going to see a lot more new content creation. And that's why our focus is on taking the tools that you guys already know how to use now and just, you know, with as little suffering as possible, just dragging and dropping that stuff into the virtual world. And then focusing our intelligence on latency, voxelization, server deployment, you know, making that all work for you. Carl? Uh, when I was at your office uh, a few weeks ago, you talked about uh, identity a little bit, and I think in light of the Oculus Facebook thing, it would be interesting to hear a little bit about how you plan on tackling it. Yeah, it's great. So, I did, so identity. identity. Um, I, I, do, I do feel very passionate about this. We, we, we did get a chance to watch a lot of experimentation in identity. Uh, I, I don't mean like physical identity. I mean literally all these issues of how you sign in and what does your name mean and who can see it. I think that for virtual worlds to be successful, they without question have to have the same kind of transactional and under your control identity properties that we have in the real world today. You would not want to walk down the street of a new city in the real world with a flag floating over your head that said Philip Rosedale, High Fidelity, Comma, Inc., San Francisco, California. There's many things in life. The transaction of meeting someone is a choice to reveal identity. I start with, hi, I'm Philip. Then I say, oh, I'm Rosedale. You know, in fact, I live in San Francisco and I have kids and blah, blah, blah. 
identity is a very important part of the human uh, tension that we all have. So I think that, in short, I mean, maybe I'm waxing a bit poetic there, but I have a, we have a very specific design for this, which is already, you can already play with a bit in the alpha, which is your identity is a tie back to a persistent set of information which you disclose completely under your, uh, in the moment, with the person that you want to disclose it with. And the default choice, I guarantee you, that makes virtual worlds really big is zero. You don't identify anything at all. So, so no, I don't think that uh, using an ID from an existing service like Facebook or something like that, or your email address even, it, it's simply not going to work. We've got to have a persistent, well, we'll have a persistent identity because we build the world, we build our spaces, we build our avatars. But, but there's, there's no, no way, way that it's going to make everything take off to forcibly tie that back to a single identity. In much the same way that things like transferring objects between people in a reasonable way that respects copy protection and engages them in commerce and all that stuff, these are complicated problems. They're not easy to solve. And I don't think that, I think a lot of things in the virtual world can't just be trivially started up by copying and pasting from some model that existed on the web because the whole point of the virtual world is that it's richer than that. We believe we're going to make money, for example, as a company, and admittedly we're future looking in this, but we have a big vision about this all. We're going to make money because we're, you're going to need a much more complicated set of services around names, around identity, around currency, around what you buy and sell. You're going to want all this stuff. If you go over to your friend's house to play, you're going to go over there as a naked white avatar? No, you, you want to bring your clothes with you. Well, if you think about it, a lot of comp complexity comes out of that. Not just the transferring the files problem, but, you know, does your friend want you to bring clothes that you bought from this place? Or, I mean, these are all very interesting issues and ones that are rich. And we hope we can build a good business servicing uh, the people that are in all these worlds, uh, you know, for our company. And then at the same time, as Carl said, just pushing out there this basic layer that you've seen tonight of internet work, small servers, that's hopefully useful and interesting and fast and fun enough to get all of us jumping in together and then just trying to back up, pull the camera back and build uh, a good business on top of that. All the way in the back. Thank you for asking that. That gives me hope that we'll make some money someday. Um, so when can you, when can you register your there's going to be unique usernames. Uh, we, we don't think that's, I mean, that, that's something you'll just do. No, you can't do it today. Very soon, I would say. Very soon. We're, we're just going into this alpha program. There's a sign up today. It doesn't give you a unique username yet, but as soon as we accept you into the program, you do get one of those, and hopefully that'll persist forever. There's also going to be names attached to locations in the virtual world. You know, who's going to own San Francisco is going to be as interesting as a, a debate. Uh, as who's going to own SanFrancisco.com. So that's another thing that's going to be available. That's not up yet either. Right now in Alpha, we're just hooking together a bunch of our machines and your machines in a kind of a test grid to verify that all this craziness actually works. And then we'll throw the switch and uh, open it up more completely. But the, the open source nature of how we're building it, the code is all on GitHub today. You can get it and build it yourself right now without even being in our Alpha program. It allows you to run a solo, standalone server in exactly the same way that you might run an Apache server. And so, and I think it's a good thing, it's fundamentally a bit out of our control, I mean some aspects of it. But our hope is that we can do a good job of being your DNS provider for the world, among other things. You can already do this, like that club that we jumped to has the name CH Club Hi-Fi, hey, that's a short one. Uh, and you can just type those letters, you, you literally type at sign today and I say CH and boom, I'm in the club. Pretty cool, right? <laughs> so, uh, it, it's a pretty neat system already. And so that little transaction right there is what we hope to provide as a business to you. Yes? How much of the world do you intend to build out? How much, how many worlds or how much content do you intend to build out before letting everyone run wild and build their own? Well, like I said, I think because right now you could start up a server and invite your friends over in High Fidelity. You literally could do that tonight. It wouldn't be easy. Uh, you'd have to read a lot of stuff on GitHub and go through a bunch of build instructions. But you could start your server up, and if you open the ports correctly on your network, your friend could actually 
be standing next to you uh, like this tonight. Um, uh, what I think we're going to do is, I've always been a big fan of a big, amazing cityscape sort of ecosystem. I, I don't know, maybe that's just my personal thing that I love, but I think what we'll do to sort of show the power of the system is start borrowing a lot of your machines, hopefully you'll let us use them, um, and putting them all together in a pretty amazing little city or forest or something like that that'll stand up as a really remarkable example of where this is all going, and then I think you know, we'll get, obviously, other people competing in a, in a good way with us and, you know, building their own uh, spaces and hooking them together. But actually, it'll be, let me think, it'll really be doable right from the beginning. We, we won't get to make that choice completely. We'll just probably ask everybody to, you know, and rely on economic factors to make it work. I, I bet that you'll all come and let us use your machines while you're asleep to build to, to animate the flocks of birds and the growing trees and the little virtual Silicon Valley or whatever we want to call it. I, I think you'll let us do that because it'll just be so fun to watch it happen. And I think if we could get 20,000 or 50,000 servers, you know how amazing that would be? Here's a number for you. There's only 600,000 servers, we estimate, plus or minus, uh, on Earth in server farms. That's all of rack space. I'm not counting Google, uh, certainly not Google's uh, uh, private machines for search. I'm counting uh, uh, Rackspace and I'm counting uh, 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 Amazon, AWS. The number is somewhere between a half a million and a million machines. Since 2010, laptops and PCs like mine sold almost all of them connected to high bandwidth networks. Most of those networks at 40 milliseconds pink time, say, across the country from each other. There are 600 million machines out there. It's three orders of magnitude more. Second life today is about, second life today today is about 40,000 uh, host uh, islands. That's enormous, but think what it would be like if we could have 40 million. I mean, second life is so staggeringly large, it, it boggles the mind and beautiful. I mean, you can't believe how much is in there. But what's it gonna be like when it's two or three orders of magnitude larger than that? And if we can use everybody's machines together in a common network, it can be, and it can be really fast. Like those machines are just heating your houses today. So if I could borrow them from you tonight, I mean, and you're on Comcast, right? Which is all you can eat. So if I can use it as a small voxel server, like the one serving that David over my left shoulder, uh, why wouldn't you let me? And if I could give you a little bit of a, a a uh, de novo currency to allow you to then go buy things from each other or other people in a marketplace, that should all work out. At least that's what we think. Carl, I don't know how much time we have in terms of your schedule or more questions. Okay, one more. Uh, yes, sir. With the glass. Have I read Ready Player One? I sure have. And as soon as I got done with it, I sent a mail to its author. Um, and uh, said how much I had enjoyed it and, and that I was really, really blown away by it. I, I think it's a great technical vision for what we're doing. Uh, it feels a lot to me like Snow Crash did in 91, I think. Uh, he, sorry, what's the author's name? Ernest Klein. Ernest Klein, right, has really laid out a great vision of what something like High Fidelity will look like deployed. I don't think the big evil oasis is the likely outcome. I think it's it's going to be a decentralized system like we're describing. I, I don't think at this point to get much beyond the scale of virtual worlds as they are today. I don't think you could do it without an infrastructure that feels like Apache, where there's just a standard code base, a well-described protocol, conferences where we can all get together and rough out what the common commonalities of avatars need to be or uh, how the currency system is going to work or how peering is going to work between these networks. Um, I think it's more likely at this point that something rapid is going to happen like that. And we're hoping as a company to build a lot of that for you and, and to help catalyze that, that movement and have the benefit of building some overlay services on top of it that we can make money from. Thank you uh, very much. And if you want to play around with it, uh, happy to <laughs> yeah, wow. There's a lot of amazing ideas in there. I'm really excited to see where this goes.
Um, I'm also in the Alpha, so if, I've, I've been so busy lately that I'm not in there as much as I should be, but um, sign up and uh, come find me in there. I'm Carl in English. I'm pretty excited about Thank you for letting me be my name. <laughs>
genius of Jerry would be able to figure out, oh wow, this actually solves a lot of the, the problems of VR. Yeah, I've never I've always heard about you guys. I mean, of course, of course, I knew about it. Yeah. yeah. So these are little tail pins. No, L cross trajectories. Simple, you know, take them straight out of a, uh, a microphone. Like a cell phone camera. Yep. Or a cell phone type of projector. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so this is the display emitter. So you, you want to, you can loop that back or whatever, like you said, you'd have to, you put a clip you'd have a clip on with an optical and a uh, reflector. But actually, it becomes a very immersive VR experience projected onto your eyes instead of. So it's no screen. 1280 by 720. And have you figured out lensing to actually, have you guys actually tested yet? Uh, like a, a lenticular assembly or whatever that will give you kind of wrap around you? And then you're using uh, uh, this camera to do what? It's basically it's that, doing the position. So down here we have a position plate. Oh, got it. It's pulsing out into red LED. Gotcha. And now we're reading where the position is. Gotcha. The reason why we do it that way is because it's a large keyboard. We want to be able to look around wherever the surface is. Yeah. We can put both of these positions out in the environment. Yeah. Yeah, it's neat. Look at that. Thank you. 